Hey, First Assembly, this is Pastor Wes, and I want to welcome you to Wednesday's Word. Hey, listen, it's so good to be with you this evening. I want to thank you guys for joining, tuning in. And if you're watching on Facebook, if you could hit the like button. If you're watching on YouTube, if you'd hit uh, the subscribe. And uh, man, if something said tonight uh, just stirs in your spirit, send this to a friend. Pass this on to somebody that you think might need to have this encouragement. And uh, let's let the Lord uh, use us. Comment. Let us know you're there. We want to hear what we're praying for because I believe God is moving. And we want to be able to bring your request to Him. And if you've got a testimony to share, you know, let me know. Um, this is cool because going into the fall of 2021, we were in a series on the Hall of Heroes. And then we kind of hit... Uh, Thanksgiving and the Christmas season and we kind of got off dealing with those thematically and and whatnot and starting this year and and kind of coming into 2022 and knowing God's doing a new thing but I could not shake in my spirit the fact that I felt like God wanted me to finish this series to finish this things because without faith it is impossible to please God. And I want us in 2022, as we're prevailing, which is our theme, it's going to require faith in your life and faith in my life. And so to follow God, to please God, we're going to need faith. And that tells me this, that I'm going to face things that I might look at and it may be challenging to me and I'm going to have to trust God in and through it. And so when you read Hebrews chapter 11, and that's where we're going to be tonight, we are introduced to people uh, that we look back on and we say, oh my gosh, we read these names, we've heard the stories, there have been sermons preached on them, and we go, my gosh, they were people of such great faith, like they never struggled and there was never fear and and they just always got it right. And, and is that the goal? And the truth is that that's not really the truth. When you look at the names of the people that were in Hebrews 11, and yeah, they did some great things and powerful things, and they stepped in faith. And and I think as we study them, you can learn from that, I can learn from that. But they also were people who made some pretty big blunders. They also were people who made some pretty significant uh, mistakes that God redeemed them and redeemed that season of their life. And so I'm not trying to sound weird and and I kind of always have to preface this, but I am encouraged by the fact that some of them made some stupid decisions because in my life, I've made my occasional stupid decision. And if God can redeem their foolishness, then God can redeem mine. And I believe that God can redeem yours. And I just love it because I think that means God can use anyone and everyone that I know. Now we tell stories of Hebrew 11 and of great faith they had. And, and I wonder if in that moment when they were moving in obedience, if it felt like great faith. I mean, I wonder if if they, when they were God speaking to him and they're saying, okay, I'm going to do it. If they knew uh, the impact that this was going to have, or they knew the legacy that would flow from this decision, or if for their lives, it just felt like they were simply doing the next right thing and stepping in obedience to God in that moment. And then all of a sudden, God moved and God does the miraculous. And so if it could be like that for them and and God do that, then I believe that it can be like that for us. Uh, I I believe that things hit us, things stir our spirits, and and we simply obey and then God can do something life-changing. We're moved with compassion and then God does a God thing bigger than we ever thought or imagined. And we don't always fully see it until looking back at it. Uh, you know, you feel inclined to call someone and encourage them or speak to them on a, on, on, on a Sunday or, or, or something. And, and there's a conversation that takes place and, and you just think, wow, man, I'm so glad I called them. That just felt right to do. But what you hear later is that that conversation was a birthing point of change in their life and helped them to shift and turn where God does something bigger than you realized he was doing. And I think sometimes that happens. Faith functions like that. 
You know, you didn't know that before you went and prayed for them. You didn't know that before you picked up the phone and simply moved in obedience to what God was asking you. You know, I don't think great faith always feels like great faith in the moment. I think sometimes great faith feels like simple obedience until God steps in and does the miraculous. Now, now certainly there are big moments that feel like big moments. And and man, those are those are awesome and, and nervous and scary and powerful and unbelievable. But I don't think we always understand understand legacy. Um, I think that there's a lot of spiritual legacy that comes out doing little things in faith consistently. Um, I, I, I think that's a, that's a big deal. Stay steady and faithful and obedient in the little things. And sometimes one of those little seeds is going to be a mustard seed that's going to grow and bear fruit and the birds of the air can rest in its branches. Okay. So in Deuteronomy chapter six, we're given this pattern to legacy and how to pass it on to others. And, and it was regular contact with the word of God. Right? We're not going to grow outside the word. We're just not. We, 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 can, we, we can learn some things, but to truly grow, we've got to be grounded and based in the word of God. It was to be taught diligently Okay, not just something I take into my life, but something that I pass on and share to others. And it was to be a part of our lives no matter what we were doing. So I said it this way, if he's the Lord of everything, involve him in everything. You know, faith that is only on Sunday a.m. and Wednesday night isn't really faith at all. Um, you know, if your God is only situational, um, then, then you need to meet my Savior. You know, uh, to do life with God is to do life with faith. Um, Isaac was a liar. He was a deceiver uh, who had a moment with God and his hip was damaged and he limped for the rest of his life. But in that very same meeting, his heart was corrected and healed and he lived differently for the rest of his days. You know, and I love that God doesn't give up on us. God doesn't give up on you, even if it's been a mess, even if it's been some struggle, even if it's been some trial. God has a purpose and God has a plan for your life. And God doesn't just do things in our lives to stay with us, but for us to pass it on to others because God is a generational uh, God. He's the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Why do they always say that? Because those are generational things. God wasn't just Abraham's God. He gave us some things to Abraham that, that Isaac was to live out and that Jacob was to live out. And the truth is that continues to be passed on and passed down just like we pass things on to our children and to our children's children. The baton is always meant to be passed. And uh, you don't have to be perfect, but we are called to be righteous and to do this intentionally. So we need to be intentional in our faith and we need to be intentional about who we are and how we communicate it on to others. Now, we took some time last time in the fall when we were wrapping this up and we looked at the life of Moses um, with a with kind of a special emphasis on his parents. Because how did Moses get to be great? Well, I want to tell you, greatness was instilled. Greatness was modeled. Greatness was taught. We know that in Exodus eleven twenty three that his parents hid Moses when they were supposed to have killed him because he was a male child born in that day. But they didn't. They said, we fear God more than we fear the Pharaoh. And so they hid him for three months, which was a direct violation of the king's order because they value what God had to say more than they valued what the king had to say. And so Moses grew up because his parents modeled and poured the right things into his life, that there was a spiritual DNA that was passed on to him and into him. And it wasn't just something that they talked about. This wasn't just something on the way home from church on Sundays. They said, hey, what did you learn in class today? And yeah, it's important to, to, to obey God and love God. This was something that they put into practice every day of their life, and it became a part of the DNA of his life. They chose to hide him and not to kill him, and, and they kept him when he was young, and as he got older, and it was hard to, to keep Moses hidden. And we all know some babies, when they're quiet and cool, and you can, you can you know, hold them and hide them and, and, and whatnot, but you know, a three, four-year-old, that's a little tougher. That's a little more work, and so they got to the place that they needed to do something to secure him, and so they knew where in the river the Pharaoh's daughter would go and bathe, and so they put Moses in a basket 
in the river where she would go, believing that she would go down, see the basket, discover the baby, her maternal instincts would kick in, and she would not throw him in the river and end his life, but take him and save him. I, I, listen, God loves a good plan, and God especially loves when we follow his plan. And so Pharaoh's daughter does that. She goes down, she finds Moses, she recognizes him as a Hebrew baby, and then lo and behold, there's Moses' sister saying, oh, do you need me to get someone to, to help you take care of this Hebrew baby? And she's like, please do. And so Miriam goes and gets Moses' mom, who ends up being paid by Pharaoh's daughter to care for her own child. I mean, you, you couldn't script this. It, it's just unbelievable the way that it goes. And so they raise him until he's old enough to go and to live in the palace. And the thing is this, you never will discover what God can do until you find yourself at a place that you truly, really have to trust Him. Moses' parents weren't going to be controlled by the culture. They didn't let it set their lives, but they decided to trust in God. And that's the key. Living by faith means choosing God's plans over the culture's plans and being obedient and watching God work it out for your good and your benefit. And when you see the impact of his parents' lives, I love this, Hebrews 11, 24, 25. It was by faith, Moses, when he grew up, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, he chose to share in the oppression of God's people instead of enjoying the fleeting pleasures uh, of sin. And, and so even though he grew up in the Pharaoh's palace, his mom had instilled in him, a, a, a you know, I think at a spiritual DNA level, a true understanding and foundation of who he really was. That while he grew up in a palace, Moses knew who he really was inside. And so at this time that he's, you know, this is going on, he's around 40 years old. He's set, he's set in power. He's living in influence. He's got a good life laid out for him. It's just easy living from there on. And he looked at it all. Uh, but there were some things that had been sown into his life that influenced his life more than the culture. And, and I think that's true of all of us. I think it's... We are always kind of find that battle of the world trying to lure us into, hey, this is what everyone does and how everyone lives. These are the things that everyone wants. But I think some guy, sometimes God just simply says, I have a different path. And if you'll hear me and listen to me, uh, you will experience things that you never would otherwise. And so Moses' parents, they raised him to show him that he had an option. And, and I think that there are people in life that, uh, that live a certain way and think a certain way and react a certain way because they don't realize that they really have another option. You know, how many people live in darkness because they don't know that there's a different way? I thought that's what everybody's goal was, to have money, have a big house, have a nice car. I just, I thought that's what you do. Everybody around me stepped on whoever they needed to to get what they want, so that's what I did. And all of a sudden, someone comes along and, and says, hey, there's a different path you can take. And I think that's why it's so important for you and I as followers of Christ to let our light shine, to be salt and to be light, to help people say there's a different way. Now, I was very blessed uh, with my parents uh, growing up, and they modeled a lot of good things into, in, into my life. But I can't tell you how many times in my life something will arise, and your flesh wants to respond one way, but all of a sudden there's this spirit inside of me that kind of jumps up and says, Hey, Wes, there's a different way. Um, yeah, I know you're upset. I know you're angry, but you don't have to respond like the world. You know, you can respond differently. And I have seen in my life and through, throughout the ministry that God has, has blessed me you know, with, I've seen marriages completely turned around. I've seen homes that were just chaos and struggle shift and all of a sudden become something so much more. I've seen relationships that were broken, restored, because people realized I don't have to respond the way I used to. There's another way. There's a plan uh, that I can walk with God. And so I love that. You know, Moses wasn't perfect. He, he made some mistakes. And, and that's true of him. It's true of you. And it's true of me, you know. Uh, and we know the big one. You know, one day Moses is walking and he sees an Egyptian uh, beating up an Israeli uh, man. And Moses rises up and kills him, hides the body. Uh, and it ends up running for his life. Now, I'm going to start off. I want to be very clear. It's never really a good option uh, when your answer is, I'll just kill him and hide the body. 
That's, that's usually a no-go for me. It's usually a no-go for me. There are going to be a lot of problems in our lives that we're going to face. And, and I just don't think um, that sometimes the flesh answer is, is ever really the best answer. But what I do appreciate about Moses was this. He was confronted with a situation. And while he wasn't spiritually, mentally, emotionally ready to do it the right way, he understood something's going to change. Something's going to be different. Now, he rose up and killed the guy and ended up running for his life for 40 years. I don't think it was a great decision and a good decision. But what I love is this. He said, I'm going to go with God. And the truth is, I'm going to, I'm going to take a stand. And once he began to take a stand, then these things all started um, to be redeemed. And he, he had to live with the consequences, uh, as do we. You know. So here's my thing. When in your life you decide, I'm going to go with God and I want to do things God's way, there are going to be consequences that we deal with because there always are. Uh, when you say, I'm going to do it God's way, you may find some relationships in your life change. There are going to be some things that you gain and some things that you lose. But I love how it was said. It said this, he chose to share the oppression of God's people instead of enjoying the fleeting pleasures of sin. And uh, I love that because it really addresses a couple of truths. One is this, um, you know, sin can feel fun. It can be. It, it can feel fun, but it is at best fleeting and temporary. Uh, the issue with sin is that it locks us in on a plan that it's never going to work. Uh, I love it. The wages of sin is death. Not sometimes, all the time. Is there ever a sin that I can do that the wage is anything other than, than death and destruct? No. It will always steal, always kill, always destroy. And so the thing with sin is to stay at the fun level, we often have to up our dosage to get the same feeling, to get the same emotion. And I think Moses came to a place in his life that he looked and said, I don't want to keep going with the fleeting. I don't want to keep going with the temporary. And he made a decision with his heart that I'm going to make the long-term investment. And, and sometimes that is. We think just because we turn to God, everything's going to be different overnight. Um, that's not always the case. Sometimes you need to turn to the Lord and say, God, I'm trusting the long term. I'm trusting that as I start making right decisions, it's going to begin making some changes. And in time, I'm going to build a different direction. I'm going to end up at a different place and walk it out with God in faith. I love that. You know, he stopped, Moses stopped looking at the fleeting moments. Now, when he stepped out and killed the Egyptian, God saved his life, but God didn't remove the consequence of his actions. And so Moses had to run. He left position and influence and ran and ended up hiding in the backside of a wilderness as a foreigner for 40 years of his life. Um, and the truth is sometimes detours come into our lives and there are a lot of things we learn in those detours. Um, but I, I just, I know and I believe and I've experienced and I can tell you it is true that God wastes nothing. Uh, God will use all of it to teach us and to grow us and to position us back where he wants us to be. And we saw that 40 years later after Moses ran at 40, spent 40 years in the wilderness and, and sees a bush burning in the distance that was on fire but not burning up. And God calls him out of that to go back to Egypt and to lead Israel out of bondage because God had heard their cries. And God redeemed Moses and God can redeem us. And whenever we take detours, God's not going to waste that. We will deal with consequences because that's the way life works but God can redeem those moments. So if there's something that is true of Moses and everyone else listed in the Hall of Faith, and it will be true of us um, if we're going to be people of faith uh, in our lives, and it is simply this. Anyone who wants to walk in faith is going to know risk. We're going to know risk. Uh, faith includes an element of risk. Uh, and this is a point that, that you will come to. And, and I wish it was only uh, one time in your life you make the decision and it's all done. But I think this is something that God keeps bringing us to throughout our lives that we're going to have to make a decision and choose a path. And there will be times that we have to say, God, what do you want me to do here? And God's answer might look risky to you, uh, but it is still God's answer. And everyone in the Hall of Faith came to a place that they had to make a choice and put all their eggs in one basket. Uh, and they did. You know, you can't do both. I can't live in God and in the world. I can't move in faith and in the, the culture of the world. I can't live in two different operating systems. And so when it comes to faith, there's a risk because of the very nature of faith. You don't know how it's going to turn out, but you move forward in hope 
and trust and belief that it will. And that's the part I think that honors God, that I'm risking for him because I know he is dependable because the Bible tells me that he is. That God in his word gives us promises that he wants us to act on before we see them all worked out before us. God says, trust me and step in faith. I will honor my word. And, and because I've said this, you believe that knowing that I will keep my word. And it's a risk, but I believe he'll do what he says he's going to do. You see, it's easy to trust when things are easy. But in a spiritual crisis, you know, when you're caught between a rock and a hard place, that's the moment that sometimes God puts us in so that only God can fix it. Only God can do what needs to be done. God's going to save us or this is going to be really, really bad. And it's really interesting because in the next section section of, of Hebrews that we're going to watch, we watch a switch from God talking about faith in the individual to God talking about faith in the context of a group of people. He's dealing with Moses, and then he switches it to talking to all of the people of Israel. And so not only do you and I in our life need individual faith that I think is so important and so critical to our lives individually, but also we have to move in corporate faith where we come together and we believe God together. It is faith combined. What we do individually matters, but what we do together also matters. And so look where Israel had to corporately move in faith. Hebrews 11, 28 to 30. And it was by faith that Moses commanded the people of Israel to keep the Passover and to sprinkle blood on the doorposts so that the angel of death would not kill their firstborn sons. It was by faith the people of Israel went right through the Red Sea as though they were on dry ground. But when the Egyptians tried to follow, they were all drowned. It was by faith that the people of Israel marched around Jericho for seven days and the walls came crashing down. You see, Moses' faith as the leader set the precedent for faith for the children of Israel and how they were to follow God. He had influential faith. He believed and trusted God and he communicated that and it helped others to believe and to trust in God. And God told Israel, listen, tonight the death angel is going to come through Israel or Egypt. They're going to walk through. But if you take the blood of a spotless lamb, offer it up and mark the post of your house, the angel will pass by. But if you don't, it's going to result in the death of your firstborn. Listen, this is like what? You don't read about this before. You've never heard about this before. Sounds a little weird. Sounds a little gross. Uh, but yet they heard, they took a risk, and they acted in faith. You see, we have faith because we believe that someone's telling us the truth. Even if I don't see it, I believe that it's true. And Israel had just seen all of the plagues. Moses came and said, hey, listen, frogs are going to come. Lice are going to come. Uh, darkness is going to fall. And every time Moses said something was going to happen, it happened just like he said. And so for him to come and say, put blood on the posts of your home and the angel will pass by and you'll be spared because of him, they believed that what he said was going to happen was going to happen. And so they acted and Israel was spared. So that was one of the things. Another thing is this. They left all they had known for 400 years to leave Egypt. Uh, there are lots of people, and, and you got to hear me when I say this, there are a lot of people who stay enslaved to things because they're simply familiar. We're afraid to do something new. Um, you know, uh, better to deal with the devil you know, I guess. And, and look at this, Exodus uh, 12, 33-36. All the Egyptians urged the people of Israel to get out of the land as quickly as possible, for they thought, we will all die. So the Israelites took their bread dough before yeast was added. They wrapped their kneading boards in their cloaks and carried them on their shoulders. And the people of Israel did as Moses had instructed. And they asked the Egyptians for clothing and articles of silver and gold. And the Lord caused the Egyptians to look favorably on the Israelites. And they gave the Israelites whatever they asked for. And so they stripped the Egyptians of their wealth. God had shown up so powerfully that those who held them captive begged them to leave and they gave them all of their wealth on the way out. Listen, guys, God can change things in a moment. They left all that they knew, but in faith, 
watching God move. They left with joy for whatever lied ahead. You see, they had faith moving forward. And even after they left, you know, Pharaoh's heart, you know the story, was hardened. And and Pharaoh regretted letting them go. And he said, I'm going to go out and capture them again. And there's really no other way to describe it other than God let Israel kind of get backed in a corner. And if you look up a, a, of a map of the Red Sea and where they crossed and where they were entering, they really had a sea behind them and there was no escape. God let Israel get backed in a corner between a rock and a hard place and to the point that if God didn't show up, it was really going to be bad. It was really going to be bad. And you know the story. Israel saw Pharaoh coming. They quickly lost faith. You know, it happens. They start blaming Moses. They're complaining about how good it was. This is what they said to Moses, uh, Exodus 14, 11 to 12. So why did you bring us out here to die in the wilderness? Weren't there enough graves for us in Egypt? What have you done to us? Why did you make us leave Egypt? Didn't we tell you this would happen while we were still in Egypt? We said, leave us alone and let us be slaves to the Egyptians. It's better to be a slave in Egypt than a corpse in the wilderness. This is what... This is what Israel's telling Moses. A minute ago, they're shouting and joyful and, oh, God's so good. And now they're like, you've ruined us. You've ruined us. Listen, when faith is lost, and it's true of them and it's true with us, when faith is lost, everything else begins to crumble. Our strength is gone and potential has left the room. But we see again how the faith of one can impact the faith of many. But Moses, 13 and 14, told the people, Don't be afraid. Just stand still and watch the Lord rescue you today. The Egyptians you see today will never be seen again. The Lord himself will fight for you. Just stay calm. I love it in scripture. Israel's crying to to Moses and Moses kind of tells him, shut up. Just, Just stop crying. Stop it. And then Moses turns around and goes to God and says, Hey, uh, God, listen, I really stuck my neck out for you on this one. I told them you were going to do something, so any time would be great for me. And I love what the Lord says. Moses told Israel to stop crying, but look at what God says to Moses. He says, Why are you crying out to me? Tell the people to get moving. I love that. Listen, you can stand here in fear and die, or you can walk in faith and find freedom. And this is a big thing for the life of any believer. I think we understand more scripture than we walk in. All right, we're educated beyond our obedience level because it's risky. And because it's risky, it's sometimes scary. You know, I believe that I can lay hands on the sick and God can heal them. And I have seen God do so. I have seen God do it. I have seen God do it. I've also laid hands on the sick and prayed for folks and nothing seemed to change. And we wonder, God, hey, listen, if I step out, are you going to do it? You know, God doesn't, and I, and I want to be honest, God doesn't always part your Red Sea. Uh, he doesn't always feed your 5,000. Uh, God doesn't always knock the giant over that's standing in front of you, challenging you. Faith isn't about getting God to do what I want him to do. Faith is about trusting him to do what he wants to do in his timing and me letting go of my need for control. Um, you know, and maybe you feel like Moses. Maybe you feel like Moses. Maybe you feel like, hey, God, listen, I love you and I trust you and I believe in you. And, and I'm, I'm, I'm telling people who you are and I'm telling people what you do and, and they're looking. And so please show up and do it. Because if you don't, God, I'm, I'm going to look like a fool. I'm going to look like a fool. I love this. We know that Moses cried to God because God told him, stop crying to him. But here's what God said I want you to do. And it always involves faith. And this is a chunk of scripture, but follow with me. He said, pick up your staff and raise your hand over the sea. Divide the water so the Israelites can walk through the middle of the sea on dry ground. So it wasn't just the parting of the sea. It was the drying of the ground. There were multiple layers of miracles in this. He said, I'll harden the heart of the Egyptians and they'll charge in after the Israelites. My glory will be greatly displayed through Pharaoh and his troops and his chariots and his charioteers. When my glory is displayed through them, all Egypt will see my glory and know that I am the Lord. 
Then the angel of the Lord, who had been leading the people of Israel, moved to the rear of the camp, and the pillar of cloud also moved from the front and stood behind them. The clouds settled between Egypt, or the Egyptians and the Israelite camps. As darkness fell, the cloud turned to fire and lighten, lightening up the night. But the Isra Egyptians and the Isra Israelites did not approach each other all night. Then Moses raised his hand over the sea, and the Lord opened up a path through the water with a strong east wind. The wind blew all night, turning the seabed into dry land. So the people of Israel walked through the middle of the sea on dry ground with walls of water on each side. Then the Egyptians and all of Pharaoh's horses and chariots and charioteers chased them into the middle of the sea. But just before dawn, the Lord looked down on the Egyptian army from the pillar of fire and cloud, and he threw their forces into total confusion. He twisted their chariot wheels. He made their chariots difficult to drive. Let's get out of here uh, away from these Israelites, the Egyptians shouted. The Lord is fighting for them against Egypt. And when all of the Israelites had reached the other side, the Lord said to Moses, Raise your hand over the sea again, then the waters will rush back and cover the Egyptians and their chariots and their charioteers. So as the sun began to rise, Moses raised his hand over the sea, and the water rushed back to its usual place. The Egyptians tried to escape, but the Lord swept them into the sea. Then the waters returned and covered all the chariots and the charioteers, the entire army of Pharaoh. Of all the Egyptians who had chased the Israelites into the sea, not a single one survived. You know, when we were wrapping up our, our, our month of, of prayer, it started as 21 days and it was just so good we extended it. You know, there were several who mentioned there's a little bit of sadness about this ending. And you know what? The Holy Spirit just so impressed me so strong. This is not an ending. This is ascending. Listen, there's a time to pray and then there's a time to walk. There's a time to seek his face and then there's a time to walk in faith and obedience. All right, the sea parted and the bottom of the sea was hard and dry enough for Israel to walk on. And it had to be incredibly scary and incredible all at the same time. You've watched waters part, there's walls, and they said walk through there. It was scary. It was dangerous. What ifs? What if? What if the wall came down? What if we got stuck in the mud? But God showed up. But here's the thing you've got to know. Faith is always going to require footsteps. It's just always going to require footsteps. And so maybe tonight is God asking you to risk with him. Is there something God's calling you to? Is there something God's talking to you about? Maybe God's trying to elevate something in your life that's held you back, that you've tried to fight before, and it's, it's just been painful. And he's saying, I want you to trust me with this. Will you risk with me? See, we tell ourselves that we're waiting on God, but I think sometimes God's waiting on us. Faith requires action, or Scripture says it's dead. And what good is dead faith? After Israel had gotten through, uh, God tricked Egypt into following them, and they got caught and stuck and ultimately destroyed. And, and listen, what is better, escaping your enemies and always looking over your shoulder or having your enemies completely destroyed? I believe this, that when we walk with God, when we walk in faith, when I simply obey that what feels like simple obedience to me is part of a legacy that we leave with our lives and our hearts of God using us in the lives of others. I believe that the faith of one can impact the faith of many. God made it plain. God made it plain. Listen, if you never risk for him, you'll never fully see what God can do. And he made it plain why he does it. He does it there, he does it in your life and in my life. When my glory is displayed through them, all Egypt will see my glory and know that I am a God. He does it so that people see his glory. That's it. That's it. I can trust that. I can believe in that. So real quickly, closing is simply this. What is God asking you to trust him with? It's something for you to pray about. What is God asking you to trust him with? You know, what hasn't gone the way you thought it would go? Maybe there were things that were good and moving, and all of a sudden you've ended up at a place you didn't think you were going to be, and you feel caught between a rock and a hard place, and it looks like the end. It looks like, again, this failed. But maybe God is positioning you 
to say, if you'll trust me, I'm going to show you a new level. I'm going to show you a new level of power and authority. But you need to hear me and you need to obey. What are the things in your life that maybe it's time to stop crying about and start walking forward? Don't get stuck. Let's walk in faith. First Assembly, I love you. It's so good to be back with you. I bless you guys. And I pray that this week you have a great time in His presence. But more than anything, I want to encourage you to do this. Tell somebody about Jesus. God bless.